<laughs> so, what did it all mean, and what happens now? This is Question Time. A big welcome to our audience at home and here, and to our panel, the Conservative Cabinet Minister Francis Maud, Labour's Alistair Campbell, former Director of Communications for Tony Blair, the Deputy First Minister of Scotland, John Swinney of the SNP, the former leader of the Liberal Democrats, chair of his party's election campaign, Paddy Ashdown, and the broadcaster and columnist, Julia Hartley Brewer. I should, thank you very much. I should just say we did, of course, invite UKIP to be here tonight, in view, particularly in view of the election results, but nobody was available to come. I should also say if you want to text or tweet, our hashtag is BBCQT, follow us at BBC Question Time, text comments to 83981 and the red button shows what others are saying. And just before we start, you may have heard uh, Paddy Ashdown say on television earlier today that he would eat his hat. You're going to present me with one, I know. He would eat <laughs> his hat. Don't wait for it. <laughs> It's he, so wait for it. He <laughs> would eat his hat if the poll, the exit poll, was right. It was. He then added the rider he'd eat it if it was made of no. marzipan. Question time is a special presentation for oh, you, Paddy. Oh, 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 how so? Oh, how Paddy very Ashton here. How very. <laughs> uh, Yeah, just hold on a second, because we have another presentation. Oh, Alistair Campbell said that if the SNP got 58, he'd eat his kilt. Uh, <laughs> they got 56. We thought that was near enough. Yeah. So we've got a, Thank you so an much. edible yeah. kilt for... Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Uh, you, you could... Can I just say, as someone who is absolutely devoted to chocolate, I'm very <laughs> happy to help Paddy and Alistair out right. with these Can I just say that I've been offered, I think, about 70 hats uh, <laughs> on Twitter so far, and that is the nicest of them. Good. Right. Well, uh, they may melt during the programme, and we may have to move them off. But let's go on to our first question now. It comes from Jasmine Osman, please. Jasmine Osman. Yes. Um, does the SNB's landslide now make Scottish independence inevitable? Does the landslide in Scotland make Scottish independence inevitable? Francis Maud. No, I don't think so, and I hope not. Uh, I think we're strong as a United Kingdom, and I think we'd be much weaker uh, if we stopped being a United Kingdom. So I really hope uh, it won't happen. Um, it was an amazing result in Scotland, um, and there was something happening which no one had spotted six months ago. Uh, I think most people thought in the aftermath of the quite uh, uh, firm rejection of independence in the referendum last September uh, that actually the thing would, would die down, but the uh, SNP <clears throat> took on a, a new lease of life from that and, and fought a very impressive um, campaign which uh, took, swept um, uh, particularly the Labour Party away in, in, in front of it. Um, I think the lesson for all of the UK parties uh, is we need to engage more. Uh, I'm very proud of the campaign that Ruth Davidson led uh, for the Conservatives in Scotland. She was vigorous and effective, and I'm delighted that, you know, agreed we started from a low base in Scotland, uh, but we retained that base. Yeah, well, let, let's not go into um, what happened in Scotland to the Tories. Let's deal with the question, which is you now have a majority in the House of Commons. Yes. What are you going to do? Well, what we're going to do about is, Scotland. What we're going to do is, in conjunction with the other UK parties, is make absolutely sure we deliver on the pledge that we all made uh, during the re referendum campaign. Um, and, uh, and, and so there will be a, a genuine further devolution settlement, which is, a, which is a generous one, because with that autonomy has to come uh, responsibility uh, for the affairs of Scotland. Um, so, you know, is it inevitable? Absolutely not. But there's a real job for all of the UK parties to do, uh, to rebuild. And I think the uh, uh, elections next year for the Holyrood Scottish Parliament give an opportunity for there to be a very vigorous debate uh, around that. All right. Alice Campbell, what do you think should be done for Scotland? Well, we've removed your kilt, by the way. OK, so thank you. But, I mean, just to answer the question <clears throat> directly, I agree it's not inevitable, but I think it's far more likely yeah. as a result of what's happened. And I think that one of the big steps on that, I regret to say, I think it was the day after the referendum, when David Cameron went out on the steps of Downing Street, when I think it should have been a time for healing, for saying that he didn't want to be the Prime Minister of a country 
where 45% of the people wanted to leave the UK. And instead of healing at that time, he, play, he played the game of English votes for English laws. I think that, Not helped. A game. I think that helped the SNP. I, think, I agree with, with Francis, the SNP have fought a, a, a superb campaign going over many years. They really believe in independence, and you can't criticise them for that. It's what they really believe in. And I think, I'm afraid, it has become more likely because the response of the Conservative Party has been to exploit the rise of the SNP to damage us in Scotland, which it's done, and also to damage us in the Labour Tory marginals. And I'm not criticising them for that as a campaign tactic, but that's what's happened. I think it was a dangerous game. I, the, joking what, should, what should be done <clears throat> now? What do you think should be done? Well, I think the, the other thing that I found distasteful <clears throat> excuse me, is this idea that these Scottish MPs are somehow less legitimate yeah. than English and Welsh and Northern Irish MPs <clears throat> coming down. They've got to be treated with respect. And they've, they, they now have a very, very strong voice. They have stood up for something different, very different to what the Conservative Party and the Conservative Government will represent. I, they failed in their bid to, quotes, lock out the Tories. That was partly, I think, their fault and partly our fault. But the reality is, I, the, joking about kilts aside, I've been I was born in England, but I feel 100% Scottish. My family is 100% Scottish. My family is divided about this. All families in Scotland were divided during the referendum. When David Cameron, as an act of leadership, should have tried to bring the country together, he tried to fight Scottish nationalism with English nationalism, and All it right. was a dangerous, silly game. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Paddy Ashton, what, what do you think should be offered to Scotland? Well, let me first of all address the point that Alistair addresses, I think, extremely accurately. Look, that speech by Mr Cameron um, was, I think, one of the most dangerous and egregious speeches by, made by a Prime Minister of the whole of the United Kingdom. Because to have treated that vote in that way, in the referendum, um, released the genie from the bottle. Um, and then, I think, it was probably the single speech which has more damaged or placed, placed at jeopardy the Union than any other single speech made by a British Prime Minister, certainly in my lifetime and arguably ever. And the consequence of that is that you had the second rise of the SNP. Many who voted no felt themselves repudiated, felt themselves betrayed, and they joined the SNP. And these and were the, irony, the words English and, votes or yeah, English votes for English. Exactly. Yeah. Instead of saying we understand and accept and recognise the sovereign will of the Scottish people uh, and, the, and the wishes that are going to be there, and we will now give Devo Max. And then the irony of it, having released this genie himself, inadvertently I'm bound to say, he is then able to use that and has used that fear to drive votes into his own ballot box only compounds that evil. So the answer to your question is yes, I'm afraid it is. We are now more in danger of that. And I, I also make the point that, you know, if you, if you repudiate uh, with derision the settled will of any nation, the Scottish nation, uh, in choosing who their representatives would be, which I think the kind of fear generated by Mr Cameron during the election campaign did, then you will find in consequence that that nation will move <coughs> towards independence. So how we deal with this now is absolutely crucial. We must acknowledge and respect, as Alistair has said, the uh, success of the SNP, that they now speak overwhelmingly for Scotland and find the way to accommodate that. I can't agree with John Swinney's views, but I respect his party's success and I respect that they reflect the Scottish people's uh, uh, views at this moment. Right. Devo Max is the right way to go, but a quality of recognition and respect from this government having so misused this issue so far to fill their own ballot boxes, is now what is required, and if that is not provided, then I think our union is at risk. Okay. How can we use the energy that's come out of the SNP and the vote in Scotland, exactly. that fresh energy, that momentum, and infuse it into the, into the Parliament, into this new Parliament? And what can each of the parties take from that to themselves mm. to re-energise and re-engage with people in that dynamic way? Mm. <laughs> John Twinney. I, I think the lady hits the nail on the head. Scotland, I, I love living in Scotland. You won't be surprised to hear me saying that. I'm deeply devoted to my country. But the place is absolutely buzzing, and it has been for months running, running up to the referendum and since the referendum. And this election campaign, we've had a much higher turnout in Scotland than the general election campaign. The debate has been vigorous. It's been engaged. As a political party representative, getting folk out of their houses to vote yesterday was a doddle. 
by comparison to what it normally is like, because people were moved to participate. And that's what the referendum debate is generated. Is that actually, because of wanting independence? Is that because they felt, no, that, it, it's that, actually as you about, do, that independence should, should it, now... It's actually the point the, the lady has made about the fact that this is the, the referendum debate has engaged people more in the political process than they have previously been what, engaged. What, all right, what, and what did that, David, was the fact that people were faced in September with a really big choice, a big, big issue. And there were firm views, yes, and firm views, no, and people changed their minds and they you know, swithered and they <coughs> settled on their position. But it was a big question that motivated 85% of us to come out and vote but in leave, the Leaving that aside, you now have 56 MPs in, in yes. the New House, and Paddy Ashton was saying this is a voice that's got to be listened to. How, what would you like to happen for Scotland? Do you want fiscal independence? Do you, what, what are you hoping that David Cameron will offer? I don't know what, what the we, word what, offer or give Scotland, well, but will we, provide for Scotland under the arrangement, the vow and all the rest of it. What would you like to see? What we set out in our manifesto was the fact that we wanted to see the full implementation of what the Smith Commission had actually recommended. Just, just the, for the sake of people who haven't read it all through, well, which most well, haven't, what, the, what exactly the, do you want? Our, well, the Smith Commission report covered a whole range of topics in relation to the devolution of some welfare responsibilities, uh, income tax responsibilities, some wider tax responsibilities, and uh, uh, powers over employment employment services, a whole variety of different questions. And we want to see that implemented. Do you want the tax, oh, you're dealing with the heart of the issue, do you want the freedom to raise your own income tax and spend it the way you want? And that's, that's included in the Smith Commission. That's what you would like yes. to see. Right. And what we've also set out in our manifesto is our desire to move towards a situation where the Scottish Parliament is in control of all of the revenues and expenditure within Scotland. But we appreciate that takes place, that would have to take place over time. And in the interim, the type of powers we would want to seek to strengthen the Smith Commission proposals is powers to strengthen the economic performance of Scotland and to create new economic But just to clarify that, that would be the end of the Barnett formula. There would no longer be a subsidy from England to Scotland. I know you don't think it's a subsidy, but there would be no longer more money spent well, ahead in what, Scotland by what, the Westminster Government what, 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 than what, there is in England What fiscal autonomy would give us the power to do would be to control all tax raised in Scotland, all expenditure on public services, and give us the powers to improve our economic performance, which is crucial to okay. the, the whole debate. Can I make just, a couple just, of points? Can, about, can I hold you for a moment? Let's just hear from one or two members of the audience. I'll come back to you, sir. I'd like to talk about what Paddy and yes. Alistair, because I, I agree with a lot of what they said. With respect to the panel, the, the momentum for independence was there long before yeah. David Cameron made yeah. his comments on, on Downing Street, Downing Street steps. It's a, a country with the feeling of national identity that Scotland has can only live within a relevant government for so long. There are more pandas in Scotland than there are Tory MPs. Whatever you think of the Tory policies, that's a fact. Okay. And you sit at the back. Yes. It's not just uh, the ill-judged comments of David Cameron. It's the mess of the Labour Party in Scotland. They've been a mess for <clears> years. We've had substandard uh, MSPs. The best of them stayed down in London. The Labour Party were so arrogant, they thought because they held the baton when we crossed the line and uh, uh, got some devolution that they'd given us this. They hadn't. They were just holding the baton and the arrogance of the Labour Party in Scotland. And, is your, and is your view that uh, independence for Scotland is now inevitable as a result of what's happened? Is that your view? Uh, I think hopefully yes now. I think that this, the, the problem we had before was that uh, we, we believed the, the, the two main parties, uh, and now we don't believe them anymore. Okay. And, and the, the woman there with her hand up, yes, you, with the spectacles. Oh, it's the man it's behind. It's the man. Yeah, come on. Far away. We, well, we shouldn't forget that for, for the past quarter century, the Labour politicians in Scotland have undermined the legitimacy of the Westminster Parliament. I recall many, many times Robin Cook and other politicians in Scotland queried the legitimacy of laws passed in London. <coughs> Uh, uh, that they would not apply in Scotland. So Labour shares a large degree of burden for stirring the pot and for undermining the legitimacy of, of parliamentary mm -hmm. laws. Julie, you come in, I'll bring you back. <laughs> I think a lot of people outside Scotland as well as inside Scotland like the SNP uh, because they, you know, it does what it says on the tin. We know exactly where you stand, we know what you're going to do, which is perhaps more than we can say for 
a number of other political parties in our country. Um, but do I think that independence is, more in, uh, is, is inevitable? I think not inevitable, but more likely. But I, I don't think we could be in a situation where, after the decision last September, we have a referendum every Thursday until you get the result you want. The people of Scotland spoke. They spoke <clears> very <throat> clearly, 85% turnout, and, and they said what they wanted. However, I do think that we are going to move towards a federal system with Devo Max and, and, and the fiscal independence. But in return for that... Why are we always talking about Scotland? Why don't we talk about England? In return for that, England needs its own parliament as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, well I'll bring you all back. I'll bring you in. Francis Moore, answer, answer that point if you would. Well, I, want to, I think it's, a, it's an important point. I don't favour an English parliament, but there is something, a sense of unfairness, which was not unleashed by David Cameron no, in the aftermath. No, I, no, just was... let me finish, Paddy. It was not unleashed by David Cameron. You know, the energy that, in the Scottish political system was raised during the uh, independence referendum. Um, that the, you know, before David Cameron made that speech about the answer to the West Lothian question, which was raised, I remind Alistair, by a Labour MP mm. more than 30 years ago and has remained unanswered since. But, but that energy and the high turnout happened yeah. before that. And actually all that David Cameron was doing is saying, yes, there is an answer. Uh, to the legitimate Scottish demands for greater autonomy uh, and greater you independence. No, but no actually, there needs to be... Well, there needs to be... Well, I think Don't if you want really to really really actually to, to have a chance of holding it together and avoiding there being exactly what Julia rightly points out, which is a sense of English grievance... Which, you, which you've exploited during this campaign successfully. Particularly in the north of England. No, we didn't exploit it. This was being... This was, we were hearing this spontaneously on the doorstep. Right. I, you know, I, people were raising this, a real concern. Right. John, John, no, you, you're kidding yourself, Alistair, if you think that this was all somehow whipped up by the no, politicians. Nobody said, John, that. I, I, nobody said that. Said that. I, I, I agree with what uh, Alistair's observation, that when David Cameron came out onto the steps of Downing Street at 7 o'clock in the morning after the referendum, and moved the debate on to English votes for English laws, I thought he behaved abominably towards his partners, mm. his Labour and Liberal partners in the Better Together campaign, because he essentially squandered that agreement that they had reached, exactly. and he you know, did nothing to essentially address the, the underlying issues. And then the second thing, which I think was terrible, was that during the referendum, people in Scotland were told by David Cameron and by others that we should stay in the United Kingdom we really, we, you know, we were much loved in the United Kingdom. We'd be a lot worse off if we weren't part of the United Kingdom. We, you know, the UK would be worse off without Scotland. And then during this election campaign, <clears throat> David Cameron insulted the possible choices that Scottish voters might make to elect people like, well, my colleagues, who have just elected 56 of them to the House of Commons. And David Cameron suggested these representatives weren't good enough or weren't equal enough to be members right. of the House of Commons. And that was a contradiction so, to what he said during the referendum campaign. <laughs> and it was an insult to Scotland. And right. frankly, Thank he you. got the result from the people of Scotland that he asked for. Okay. As, uh, by those remarks. I'm going to stop you up. We've got, we only have an hour for question time tonight. We've got questions about the Liberal Democrats. We've got questions about the Labour Party. And I want to keep <laughs> moving because I think it's only fair that everybody should have a say. Indeed, questions about the Conservative Party. I want to get a question by Andy Bass, please. It may be that some of this... Uh, gets caught up in what we were talking about about Scotland. Andy Bass, indeed, this one does. Is Labour too right-wing for Scotland and too left-wing for England? <laughs> Is Labour too right-wing for Scotland? <laughs> <laughs> too left-wing for England. Alistair Campbell. Well, <coughs> this election has thrown out a lot of very, very uncomfortable questions for and to the Labour Party from the public, north, west, south and east. I don't think it's as simple as that. Uh, I, I've never bought into the myth that Labour... I, just, can I just go back to the gentleman who said about yeah, la no, Labour like. in Scotland? Because I, I accept a lot of what you say. I think that where you've had massive majorities piling up year after year after year, where you've had some MPs who've bothered with their constituencies and others that haven't, I think some of those have paid the price. Whilst, meanwhile, the, the SNP has been moving into that space totally legitimately and exploiting it. And the lesson for the Labour Party in Scotland, or one of the lessons is, if you take the electorate for granted, if you think they're going to vote for you just because they live there and just because they always have, eventually they're going to come back and bite you, and that's happened. I and in England? That, I think in England, you see, the, the reason why I do feel that, that David Cameron and the Tory party have exploited this for, as Paddy says, to, to drive up their vote, and there's nothing wrong with that in campaigns, They've, oh, had yes, a strategy. They, the they've had a strategy on their campaign, which is to oh, focus yes, on the is. economy and on leadership. 
The, following the, the referendum, I think, to be honest, I think none of us thought it was going to lead to this, but it has. Following the rise of the SNP during the campaign, I think the Conservatives saw an opportunity to damage us further in Scotland and help the SNP, and to, by delegitimising the SNP in England, make people in England concerned that John and his hordes were going to come down and basically slap Ed Miliband around the face and tell him what to do. And that's the caricature right. that's driven So it wasn't campaign. Ed Miliband and the policies of the Labour Party that well, were at fault and led you to, to fall listen, so far behind? There's, you, there's no single, there's no single right. reason why we did so badly. We did, so badly, we did badly for lots of reasons. And I think we've got to move away from this kind of Blairite, Brownite, New Labour, Old Labour. We've, the Labour Party has now got to have a fundamental reassessment of who we are, what we believe in, what we stand for, what, how we're going to face the future. Stop living in the past as we've done. I'm not talking about rerunning New Labour. Yes, you need a good leader. Yes, you need a strong strategy. Yes, you need a good team. Above all, you need ideas and policies that fit your values and fit the priorities of the people. And we're a long way from that, and that's why we've been rejected. Alistair, you keep talking about the fact that David Cameron came out after the referendum and, and talked about English votes for English laws. If it's OK for the SNP to consider the, the interests of the Scottish people, it's OK for Plaid to consider the interests of the Welsh people, who, are consi who is considering the in interests of the English people? It doesn't well, seem that anybody... Paddy Ashton, do you want to answer that? We've got to keep this moving around the table. Paddy, what do you answer uh, to Well, that? yes, I wouldn't mind going back to the Labour Party, but because but, uh, I thought Alistair was extremely clear and, by the way, I think absolutely right. Look, uh, can I just answer your question in this fashion? I, I'm, I'm a patriot, which means I love my country without having to her, her, uh, hate any other. Uh, I've spent all my life fighting destructive nationalism. I mean no insult to John Swinney, who is a, is a very fine man, or indeed the SNP. When I say that there are echoes of the Scottish debate that I have heard from the SNP, which I think are very close, not the party at the top, not all of them, but some of them, to a kind of destructive nationalism that worries me. And what now worries me is I see the same thing developing in our country. We now have an English nationalism, a destructive form of English nationalism building up. And that's what worries me most. And that is the genie that Mr Cameron, I agree, unwittingly, Unleashed. He did not create the SNP. Of course he didn't. The SNP is a proud party that's gone on for a very long time. But he did give it a huge boost. SNP Mark II was launched when, instead of standing up and honouring the promises that were made to the Scottish people about Devo Max after the referendum, he switched the debate immediately, as though we were going to sweep that under the carpet and move towards right. an English that's, devolution. That's and point, that's, though, what, that that's what created it. Nobody has come out and said that nationalism in any form is dangerous. No. SNP, no, 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 UKIP, I didn't, I didn't BMP, say that. I didn't say that. Forgive me, I didn't well, say that. Nationalism can shift to a kind of destructive nationalism. And, I and have I seen it. And I think that's what we've got with no. the SNP. They want to break well, up the I union. Might I might, argue, I might argue that sort I might argue I deliberately do not say that uh, as about the main body of the SNP, no, but she, only she, about right, some voices, Paddy, it, but she, I do say it about she, UKIP. She, she said it, and John Swinney yeah. perhaps would reply, destructive and wants to break up the UK. But what, what, uh, what our political ideology is about <laughs> is about enabling the people of Scotland to determine their own constitutional, political and economic future. That's what I'm in politics to do. And... That is to en enable and empower the people of Scotland to take their decisions. Now, why we were successful in the election uh, just yesterday, my goodness, it feels like an age ago, but it was just yesterday, mm. uh, was because we had absolute clarity in our message. It happens also to have been fabulously well explained by Nicola Sturgeon, our party leader. Is Labour too right-wing for Scotland? Is that what well, happened? What I'm, what, I'm just coming asked. to what the... Let's have extol no. the virtue of Nicola Sturgeon. Well, but I feel... I, feel I know, like, but you've I been saying I that. To, I feel I need to. Of course. Um, but, I mean, but, everybody, everybody's but, talking about the campaign they've but, fought but, and either lost or won. Let's not talk about but that. The point, Let's but, move the debate but, on a bit. But the point, the point that... Um, and it answers your question about the profile of the Labour Party. We had a very clear anti-austerity message, which we said to people in Scotland, vote for us and we will get a strong voice for Scotland at Westminster to end austerity. And yeah, we, got we, a we, we said vote for you and you get a Tory government, and that's what we've got. No, but, but no, well, what, what my point is, Alistair, if you'd taken a line which was a firm, hard, principled line to end austerity, not the wishy-washy Tory light that we got from the Labour Party, you <laughs> might have got on a bit better in England <laughs> than you <laughs> actually got <laughs> in the country. <laughs> the, the woman here, on that, the woman there, yes. Maybe instead of it being the fact that people think that the Labour aren't 
far left enough or far right enough. It's simply that they didn't believe some things that Ed Miliband said. They didn't believe that he wouldn't go into coalition with the SNP. They didn't believe his vagaries of his plan in terms of where all the money was coming from. And so they didn't feel that there was going to be strong government provided by Labour this right. time. Briefly, Alistair, if you would. Well, I, look, I, there's lots of reasons why people rejected us, both in Scotland and, and in England. I mean, I do think that, that, that Scotland now is going to have real difficulty if it does get full fiscal autonomy. We won't get into that now. But I, I'll, just about, about Ed Miliband, I thought he actually emerged with a lot of credit and a lot of dignity in the campaign. But elections, an old cliche, they're not one in weeks, they're not one in days, they're one in years. <clears throat> one of the big mistakes that I think we made whilst we were taking a long time to elect Ed as leader is that we allowed the Conservatives, who did it, again, brilliantly and strategically, they laid down the line about the mess we inherited, the mess we inherited, the mess we inherited, and we didn't rebut that. And if you've got yourselves, your opponents and the media basically say we single-handedly caused an economic, economic disaster, then it was very difficult to win on the politics of the economy. And but I it's think, also I think because you haven't got a narrative. That. Labour has I agree no with that central as well. narrative. I agree with that All right. as well. Julia I think, I think, I think it does come down to the narrative, but it, do, it comes down to the leadership as well, and, and that is part of uh, the, the, the Labour Party being perhaps too left-wing, for certainly for southern England, if not for, for northern England. And, and all of that comes down to the fact that Ed Miliband was not the first choice yesterday for the vast majority of the British electorate. He wasn't the first choice for the majority of Labour MPs in 2010. He wasn't the first choice for the majority of Labour Party members well, in 2010. And this, no, no, but that's the whole point. It was a, there are lots of different forms of democracy, sure. as you know, and you had the Electoral College. But the point is, the wrong leader was chosen. You know it, everyone in the room knows it, everyone in the country knows it. I imagine even Ed Miliband knows it. I know David Miliband knows it. <laughs> you, can hear, you can hear him smugly laughing all the way from New York. I don't think so. Um, the, the reality is that, that, that what Ed tried to sell was, was a, a, a vision, I think a very 1970s vision, mm. of class warfare, of them and us, and I, you know, nasty, evil bosses, no, you know, poor victims. I don't think the vast majority of British people, <coughs> particularly <coughs> English people who rejected Labour, view themselves as victims and think of themselves as living in the 1970s, in this them and us existence. I think they, they want to get on with their lives I and think, move I ahead. And broad, I think that it was, narrative it was, was out of touch. That. It was broader than that, but what I would agree with is that... People know that, if you like, we, we, we do have certain values that hopefully will never change. But if you lose aspiration and you lose enterprise and you Which lose you that did. sense that you understand yeah. people who want to get on and do well for themselves, you're not going to win. All right, the, the man in spectacles there. Uh, you, sir. But, no, the, oh, there are two of you. No, you haven't got spectacles. He really has. Uh, <laughs> um, on the SMB, SNP being to the left of uh, Labour, if they do get fiscal autonomy, so they have the power for their own spending and taxes, and they can run their own budget deficits. Does so that mean they will then issue their own debt, which is backed by Scotland, right. and not guaranteed by the British government, <laughs> so that English don't have to end up you know, paying for <laughs> Scotland? <laughs> well, can you, can you, can you, you know the point well. If, if, if Scotland has autonomy, uh, you know, it may find itself in some difficulty financially. Do you want Scotland to have the kind of autonomy well, that he's talking about? Well, that was, that's beyond what, as John Swinney was saying, that's beyond what was proposed in the Smith uh, Commission. Uh, and would raise all of those issues, which are very difficult issues, and those were some of the issues which actually Scottish people in the independence referendum looked at and decided this was actually too risky and too difficult to do. But just coming back to the original question um, about... I mean, I think it was uh, Alistair's old boss, Tony Blair, who nailed it. <clears throat> he said, a, when Labour fights as a conventional left-wing party, there's a conventional answer, which is that it loses. Mm. And, you know, it was in front of the Question Time audience just a week ago, or eight days ago, uh, when uh, Ed Miliband refused yet again to admit that Labour had got things wrong by spending too much. I think he did sacrifice a huge amount of credibility then. Uh, and, you know, and the answer that's is... That's because we'd lost an argument over five years. That well, was, but it's we also because it was be true. But because it was true, uh, Alistair, you say that it was somehow the mystical arts of brilliant... It's uh, not mystical Tories arts. It's not, mis it's not it mystical arts. Truth. No, you know, France, they presided, we'll the Gordon, Brown, you Gordon Brown, who you know um, uh, uh, what, what his deficiencies were better than most, um, and uh, uh, he, he, he left the country... <laughs> 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 And just described them very vividly. Um, but he, Gordon Brown left the country in a terrible, terrible state. Right, and let's the not coalition government the campaign. had to go right through the process okay. of... Uh, no, 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 nobody else. I want to hear the woman there in the third row. I think the biggest thing that did for Labour was Rupert Murdoch. If you look at the situation, the biggest winner is Rupert Murdoch. He wanted the SNP in Labour. He told Scotland to vote for the SNP. He wanted Ed Miliband out. <clears throat> 
where is he now? He wanted the Tories in a majority. Who got the majority? So it's, it's terribly insulting it's, it's, for Murdoch, the... Murdoch's <laughs> victory. It, 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 no, can I, I just deal it, with this? It, it, it is terribly it, insulting to the British public and the electors. To it's suggest terribly... that, to suggest that I'm sorry, so, but it's terribly like, insulting. So like so, the it's people, terribly insulting the are so that we gullible. have a man, a, a like Murdoch, who wields so much power thanks no. to the Conservatives. Oh, hang on, Thatcher, hang on. Thatcher allowed him have to have, you, have you met Alistair Campbell? And he's been allowed to take them further and further. It's a disgrace. Well, all right. Yeah, she was right, Francis. No, she she was right. Come to you, Julia. Now, wait a minute. Let's just skip through this point. Francis Maud and then Julia. It is incredibly patronising to no. British voters to suggest no. that Rupert Murdoch wields such power and the British public are so gullible that, they, that he can sway huge millions of voters. Fra Francis, 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 right, public, Francis, 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 on, the, on, on, on press and broadcasting for far, far too long. The reality is, actually, that there's no evidence whatsoever that any particular newspaper right. in any way drives how people vote. Can I point out, though, for 25 minutes of the hour we've got, for, there, there really is no... There is, they, oh, they've done a lot of research into it. There is no evidence. Yeah, go on. For 25... For, for no, 20, don't, please, you, you've heard your For 25 say. minutes of this hour, we've been discussing... Actually, we've mostly been concentrating on Scotland, which make up 10% of the population. If you wonder why a lot of people are disillusioned it's... in this country about politics, it's because of that. All right. <laughs> OK, I'm going to take in another question before I do, and everybody wants to get in on this, but before I, before I do, a uh, question I'm going to be in Uxbridge next week. Did Boris Johnson win Uxbridge? Yes, we're in Uxbridge. And the, and the week after, doesn't turn up. <laughs> the week after that, we're going to be in Derby, so to join us, the details are on the screen. I'll give them uh, at the end of the programme as well. James Concannon, please. Um, why do the uh, panel think the electorate seems to have punished the Liberal Democrats for the failures of the coalition and rewarded the Conservatives for its successes? Good question. Um, <laughs> Paddy Ashdown, why did you take the rap and the Tories benefit from the years of coalition? I think we have very seriously to consider what the answer to that question is, and I'm afraid this close to such a painful, um, difficult... Um, humbling and humiliating experience, <clears throat> I'm not sure I'm rationally capable of doing that. Um, look, uh, oh. we have a... <laughs> no, I don't need your sympathy. I don't, need, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't need, the one thing I don't need is your sympathy. Look, it was very tough and it was very difficult and frankly very painful, but I'm extremely proud that we stood up for those values that are quintessentially, I think, liberal values, but also the values of Britain, decency, fairness, working with others, putting the national interest first. So why were you punished for it? Well, I, the answer is virtual. that is a... That, well, that is a puzzle, but let me... Let me which I, I, I bluntly admit I can't answer. Well, let if me, you don't want let me, to answer, well, no, no, let no, me no, go no, around no, the table no, while no, you think allow, about the no, answer. No, no, allow me... And, and allow, let me no, I, hang I, on. No, but, well, David, you've, you've put me on the spot here, so let me just all right, pose some questions, if I can. All right. The first is... This, that if it is the case that a party does what it believes to be in the national interest mm. and gets a result like that last night, whoever is going to dare to act in the national interest again? If it is the case that by working with others in the national interest in order to, yes, make compromises, but drag this country out of a terrible existential economic crisis, the consequences is last night, whoever is going to do that again? If it is the case that by trying to put forward a policy of hope based on those values of respect and tolerance and fairness and working together, we get what we get last night and the, tri and the politics of grievance and fear win over hope. Whoever is going to try and do that again? The question is very much for the Liberal Democrats. We suffered last night, but my guess is the British politics suffered too. <laughs> so, uh, just in case people have missed the question, 
Why did the electorate punish the Liberal Democrats for the coalition's mistakes and reward the Conservatives for their successes? And you, of course, took most of your gains in this election from the Liberal Party, who were your partners in coalition. Why did it happen? Well, I mean, first of all, um, po politicians are ne never going to get sympathy. And a lot of very decent public servants who did a brave and honourable thing in the Lib Dem party by joining in the national interest with the Conservatives, the former coalition government, uh, saw their dreams and hopes shattered last night. And those... You never uh, said that during the election. Ever. Well, once. It John had, Major said it, well, but Paddy, you didn't. it hadn't happened then. I've lost my seat. But you knew perfectly uh, I've well what's I've lost my seat. I know what well it's like. What was happening. Uh, and it's Not a once people's did you careers. say that we had contributed towards that. Not once. So it's fine well, to say it now. Thank well, you, okay, Francis. I'm grateful for that. Okay, Paddy. John, Actually, John, John, no, no, that, that is... John, 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 John Major, John Major said that, no, but you didn't. And no, we have said Cameron. that, we have said that many times. It was no, the right thing to there. do. No, we said it many, many times. Uh, and I worked closely with some Lib Dem colleagues in government. Yeah, you were comfortable and someone like Danny Alexander, I worked very closely with, and yeah. I'm very sorry that he. You know, I've suffered the same thing myself. This it is happens, terribly like crocodile really tears bad. to me, Francis. No, well, I mean, that's a very cynical view, yeah. if I may say, Paddy. <laughs> very and, and it's, untypically, a, it's an exceedingly un cynical act. Uh, well, what? To fight an election and hope to win? No, no. Um, but you might. Look, the question is why was it that you got the benefit? Well, well, can can we I tell you one reason? Can I right. suggest a reason why the Lib Dems may have suffered disproportionately? And it is because instead of proclaiming the achievements of the oh. coalition government, uh, Nick Clegg took the unwise strategic decision so, to separate the Lib Dems no. from it and actually to claim only credit Fra for the things that they Fra prevented Francis, from happening. Francis, never once, and that's never once in the entire campaign, <laughs> never once, that in, a profoundly never negative once campaign. in the entire campaign did Nick Clegg repudiate the successes of the coalition. Never once. Right. And if you believe he did, you better show me the quotation. Oh. Um, I'll come to you. Julie Hartlebury. Um, I hate it when Mummy and Daddy fight. <laughs> um, it does feel like the sort of post-divorce Christmas lunch for the first time when Mum and Dad get together, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> I, I do have sympathy, uh, actually, because um, I, I think people do forget two very crucial things when they punish the Lib Dems at the polls, which is clearly what's happened. Um, and, and one is that the mass did not add up for a coalition with Labour uh, in 2010. There was right. no other option, and people have to stop pretending there was another option. Exactly there right. was no government or there was a Tory Lib Dem coalition. Mm -hmm. Get with the programme, that's what happened. Uh, the other issue there is, is that what is the, should, should, the, should the Lib Dems not have gone into government at all? Uh, we were in a time of huge economic crisis, regardless of whose fault it was. That, we were in that situation. Um, should they have just stayed as a sixth form debating society or as a, a minor pressure group? Yeah, but what was the punishment? Have, Why what, did they get punished well, for Well, I, well I think they've been punished for having supposedly reneged on their principles and stopped being a, a pointless pressure group, which is what they were previously, effectively, and over the issue of tuition fees. And again, I am totally flummoxed by this. Who brought in tuition fees? Labour. Who raised tuition fees? Labour. Labour. And then who proposed to raise them again? Tories. And who's got punished? The Lib Dems. I, I don't think it's fair. Um, I find it very hard to sympathise for um, any Lib Dem um, politicians or Nick Clegg because at the end of the day, he is very qualified. All of your MPs are very qualified. They can go and find themselves another job. Mm -hmm. And I really, really, really want to stress that there are going to be so many people now who... who so, so many young people who are discouraged from going to university because of how extortionate no, it is. That's not the case. There are going to be so case. many Simply poor working families who work really right. hard, who don't sponge off this state, and they really, really are going to suffer from, 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 um, from all of the um, welfare cuts which we are going to have and cuts to, to, to the public services. And I think we should stop feeling sorry for politicians <laughs> who are absolutely ah, qualified. Yeah. Oh, They've no got the million-pound houses. <clears throat> Life is great. Let's talk about the working people in this country who really, really are going to suffer okay. throughout the next five years. All right. Al Alistair Campbell. <coughs> Maybe a... well, I, I... Including your answer to that, yeah. as well as the, the other point. I, mean, I agree with a lot of that. I, I, I think the reason why the Liberal Democrats suffered more than Conservatives, if I can pay for me a rare compliment to the Tories, is that the Conservatives are and always have been ruthless bastards. <laughs> and the fact is, they have... <laughs> it's a compliment. It's, compliment. It's, very, it's, very interesting that, it's very interesting that Alistair thinks that's a compliment. Well, there's a, there's a tad, a, a bit of a, a modicum of wit in there. But the, the reality is, the reality is that the Conservative Party is about power. 
And that's why, to go back to, to your question, that's why they were a, willing, for example, to have the Leveson inquiry say they were going to do it and then not do anything about it, mm -hmm. because they are willing to stay in bed with Murdoch when, mm -hmm. to be fair to Ed Miliband, if he, like, he sacked him off. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I would say is that Nick Clegg... <laughs> Nick Clegg... Slagged him off. Yeah. <laughs> Nick Clegg... <laughs> Nick Clegg... <laughs> Nick Clegg broke a lot of promises. Yes. David Cameron broke a lot of promises, but Nick Clegg, he did, I mean, I, th I think you have to agree with Francis on this, there came a point where the public was expected to say, there's Clegg and Cameron, they love each other, they're doing it all together, and then suddenly, with a year to go to the election, the Liberal Democrats did start to have this kind of move-away strategy no. that allowed the Conservatives to do what they called the decapitation strategy, no. and the decapitation strategy has worked. All right, John Sminey. I, uh, I, I think I agree with one of the points that Alistair made, that uh, I think what fundamentally did for the Liberal Democrats was that they promised people essentially in 2010, to be anti-Tory. That's how they won most of their seats, as no. anti-Tories, no. and then went into bed with the Tories after the election and delivered policies that they said before the election they wouldn't do no. and then did after no. the election. So that, I think that, there's a, right. a fundamental break of policy. But the, the, the second thing is that... In, and this is one example I would offer, I think is illustrative of the difficulty of some of the Lib Dem behaviour in government. Danny Alexander is a minister I had a lot to do with. He's my counterpart in the Treasury, and I have a lot of personal respect mm -hmm. for him. The moment he sat beside the Chancellor and nodded his way through the budget on a Tuesday, and then on a Wednesday turned up in the House of Commons to make a statement trouncing, denouncing the contents of the budget and standing with that yeah, silly that yellow not. box outside the Treasury, is, they destroyed their credibility. That, that, that is, and I that think is, that's... That, and that, that, is, that is what... That is what gets politicians a bad name. No, John, you sit no, there on one day and you nod your head through the Tory cuts no. and then somehow you try to separate, you, se no, separate fair, yourself fair, from fair, the former day. John, that, that is hypocrisy. That is a dreadful, and I'm sure you know knowingly, misrepresenting what happened. We uh, agreed with the budget that was passed through and then proposed our alternative budget after the election. So those are not the same thing. But let me just say this. You may be certain it'll be tough, it'll be difficult. We've done it before. We will go on fighting for those values. We will, under what, whatever circumstances. And there's no other party in Britain that will do so. We will return. And I can tell you that already, today actually, a thousand people, a thousand people have joined the Liberal Democrats because they see what is at risk now if we are not a powerful Liberal force holding the centre ground in our party. We have never, paradoxically, had a better day for recruitment in, my, in our party than after what happened last night. Okay. This battle will continue um, and no. the Liberal Democrats will return mm. and we will protect those ideals and we will protect the centre ground. So defeat boosts your numbers. Curious. Anyway, Does that sometimes, sometimes, let's, sometimes it is so. Let's go, on, let's go on to another question. We've only got a quarter of an hour or so, uh, and we better keep moving. Raal San, please. Is it fair that UKIP uh, received over four million votes yesterday, but only one seat? Yes, UKIP, uh, well, nearly four, 3.9 million votes yesterday and only got one seat. Is this fair? We were going to have a UKIP member on the panel, but as I said earlier, uh, they couldn't provide anybody. Um, but is, is it fair? Um, John Swinney. Uh, well, I, I'm afraid, forgive me if I don't have an awful lot of sympathy for UKIP um, today. I, I have absolutely nothing in common with UKIP <laughs> whatsoever. Um, but up to the 3.9 million people but, be represented. But there, is a, there is a serious point which underlies this, which, mm -hmm. which is the relationship between the number of votes cast and the number of seats that parties mm -hmm. achieve. Now, mm -hmm. on the occasion of yesterday, um, that happens to have benefited my party enormously. Um, I, I saw some figures, I, forgive me, I can't remember I can all, give them to you, 27,000 people yeah. per seat yeah. for the SNP as against 3.9 million for that's one correct. seat for UKIP. That's yeah. right. And that's, so, uh, that, that's, that, I think that's a very fair comparison and that's a product of the first-past-the-post system. Yeah, yeah. It happens to have worked OK, well, very well for my party yesterday, actually, but for most of our previous 70 years of our history, it's not worked very well for us um, on most occasions. So I think it, it makes the case for uh, PR in elections. Uh, we support PR in elections, and I think it would give us fairer, more representative politics if that was the case. But please don't confuse my support for PR with any sympathy for UKIP on this particular evening. Francis Maud. Well, um, I think if a UKIP representative had been here, I think the UKIP person would have said, no, it wasn't fair because uh, parties where, who, who 
don't do well under a particular system always think it's fundamentally unfair. What would you say? It's uh, fundamentally fair. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think there's a fundamental fairness about a system where the candidate who wins most votes in the constituency wins. Uh, that seems to me a reasonably fair way to uh, operate. Uh, and, you know, is there any perfectly fair way of running an electoral system? Uh, no. Uh, there is a fundamental unfairness in our system in that the boundaries uh, do not reflect um, anything like equality in terms of numbers, so you need many more uh, voters to elect a Conservative MP than a Labour MP. Uh, and we had an opportunity to change that, which uh, sadly didn't get through the House of Commons because the Coalition failed to um, uh, retain its solidarity at that point, is the delicate way of putting it, uh, Paddy. Um, and that's capable As indeed of being, on Lord's and that's capable of being being remedied. Um, but so, is there any perfect fairness? No. Uh, but actually, you know, I think uh, when p parties moan about um, the system when they fail to win seats in an election, uh, my sympathy uh, is gets a bit. But the people, the people who have possession of the House of Commons, will always vote against exactly. a system that would eject them from the House of Commons because of proportional representation, exactly. wouldn't they? So it is never going to change. Well, it's never going. There's no, well, I mean, actually, it isn't Parliament that stopped there being a change to the electoral system. We no, had, only on a minor we, change we of AV a, that was suggested. Well, yeah, but even, we'll a, even that minor change got overwhelmingly rejected, three to one, by the British yes. public. It wasn't the House right. of Commons that stopped that happening. It was the, the British people. The woman there. No, because realistically, you're never going to change a system that you do well in. Mm, exactly. Whether it's democratic or not, the Conservatives yeah. will not change the voting system exactly. until yeah. another government comes but, in, but because we, you do well in it. Right. Then they but won't change provide, it. But we did provide a referendum. Well, but the point is the next <coughs> government won't change it, because by definition that system works for Unless them. Unless it's a coalition Patty. Sorry. to make um, it fairer. Well, well you, this, it's, it's interesting, this notion of fairness, isn't it? Because there are lots of different systems, lots of different PR systems. AV seems to me to be the most sensible system that still maintains that link between individual voters and an individual MP in a constituency. And that, as you say, was soundly rejected in... in but if you're one of the nearly four million people who voted UK yep. yesterday, would you not be feeling aggrieved I, I, now that you have only one person... Absolutely. And if I was one of the two million who voted SNP, I'd be very chuffed with my 56 seats. Uh, but but the, 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 the point is, though... Well, but... Look, I, but, no, but you know, I think, but, but, would it be okay you're, you're, if I, I finished my point, John? Well, okay. <laughs> I, 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 if, would that be okay? That's um, how Nicola talks to you. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't dare, I wouldn't even dare try to interrupt us. I think the, the key thing is, although we're concerned about it right now, I have a funny feeling in a few weeks this won't be top of our list. It won't be in the top ten of most voters' lists. It won't be the top 100. I don't think it'll be 4,736 on our list. If you're worried about... No, I think... no, Because the polls show if you're worried about keeping your home, you're worried about keeping your job, getting your kids into a decent school, getting care for your elderly parents, worrying about your pension, right. all of those things, worrying about a particular political system... But the, the voting system. You but may be interesting a to a question time audience. At Statistically, all. on the polling, it's not a top who, who, priority. Well, all right. Well, who, who said wrong? Sorry. Who said wrong? <laughs> That's a very good point. What did you say? He said, said no, no one believes polling anymore after oh, right. last Nobody night. Nobody believes anyway. polling anymore. No. Except exit polls. Who said wrong? I was, okay. oh, it was you again. Yeah, oh, I don't want again. to go back to you. <laughs> <laughs> the man in red there. You say in the middle. No, in the red shirt. Labour had 13 years to deal with this issue yeah. and did nothing, so yeah. what's the, all this fuss about tonight? Yeah. All right. Um, what is the fuss about? Well, I think the fuss about is, is in the question, the four million votes, one seat. Yeah. But I think that the lady earlier, you asked about how do you keep that sense of momentum for, for engagement. People have to stay engaged in politics all the time. Did those 3.9 million people vote yes when they had the chance to change the system? I suspect not, no. because they thought it didn't matter. And they think it matters today... So you ha we had the chance for a referendum, through a referendum to change the system. People should stay engaged in the political process, but not just once every five and years. And they were woken up and they stayed engaged and that energy yeah. has, has developed and matured. Julie is saying because people remain anxious and worried and concerned about jobs and homes and schools. No, I don't agree with that. They, yeah, 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 they won't engage and vote. Actually, I think it's a dreadful position. Keep people undermined, keep but them anxious is, and they my don't My point vote. is the current perhaps, change the system. Okay. Perhaps, okay. Perhaps the, the one... Agree. Thank you. Um, can, can we just... Um, I need to make the point that fair and representative politics is not just about power share, and there's a really obvious situation that's happened today in the way that we can refresh and regenerate politics. Three leaders have resigned today, and I look at the political system, and there is no-one there that represents my background or me. Yeah. I'm a woman. I'm, I'm a woman. I'm from the North. I'm from the LGBT yeah. community. I'm working class, and there isn't... 
all of the leaders do not represent that. Get and involved. The, I, I, want to, I want to be an MP and there is no one who I can look up to and, like, that woman is like well, me. Well, make it you then. Yeah, Get exactly, involved. exactly. Right. Get engaged. Have you had a day this time? I'm not telling you, I have not but, but you know, you've just made a brilliant advert for you getting involved. Just what brilliant. Uh, <laughs> we'll make your own. And then I'll be asking for your no. address afterwards <laughs> or your <laughs> email. But, email. You know, uh, we're putting uh, it. The Blessed Francis said the Tories didn't like, wanted to keep the system as they are, as it is. Well, in the famous words of Mandy Rice Davis, um, he would say that, wouldn't he? Uh, here, here are the figures. Uh, you use uh, 26,000 uh, for SNP, 34 for Conservatives, 40,000 for a Labour seat, 290,000 for a Lib Dem seat, 1.1 million for a Green, and 3.8 million for UKIP. Now, look, the system works roughly, very unfairly, by the way, when you have two party politics. But it works roughly. I mean, Francis Maud is right. You'll produce a Conservative government. Does it give stability? No, because the coalition's inside the Conservative Party. But what it does is it crushes out multi-party politics. But we're now in the era of multi-party politics. Oh, oh. What worked appropriate, <laughs> uh, approximately in two-party politics will not work if you have multi-party politics. Uh, so uh, we uh, have are we? The voice we, on my left Yes, say, yes Paddy, you are, are because, because what you now have is multi-party politics, but not in the same country, in different countries. Yep, sure. So Wales is red, Britain is blue, England. England is blue, London is blue, and Scotland is yellow. Now, you have got to... Red. 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 London is red. Scot Scotland <laughs> is SNP, which is yellow. Right. Yes. 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 All right, let's very stop the colour. So, colour is clearly so in other words, you now, you, <laughs> now have, you now have multi-party politics, but not in the same country, but in different nations. And that is exceedingly dangerous. We have now to create it's, an electoral system no, it's not that dangerous. properly... It's not that, people's that, that, pro party. that No, the, the, you have to now create a multi-party system of election that will give freedom of choice to the people, more power to the voters, and that means you must have the electoral reform. Otherwise, what you create but That gives more is power to political parties. All right, yeah. all right. Well, it's it doesn't not... give more power okay. to the voter. Very quickly, John. Well, Paddy Ashton is back onto this stuff of challenging the, the conclusions the electorate arrive at. The electorate no, he's just sure. saying that in uh, Scotland, uh, no, Liberal, but, Democrat but voters, just... Liberal Democrat voters in Scotland are underrepresented at Westminster. Yes, that's what he's saying. And the point that's was, not the point I was making The point I was rudely trying to make to Julia was the fact that, you know, I'm a beneficiary of this yes, system. Yes, you said that. Right, but no. I believe in PR. Yes, so exactly. there is right. possible okay, to be fine. a beneficiary well, and believe in... All right, government. fine. Stop, stop, there, stop, because we have... We, we have currently are the beneficiary. We currently are the beneficiary of first party. We'll take a lot... But we take, believe in proportion... Thank you very enough. much, Paddy. I want to take a last question. We've only got five or six minutes left. It goes to the heart of what is on the agenda for this new parliament. It's a question from Claire Dunkley. Can David Cameron keep Britain in Europe? Can David Cameron keep Britain in Europe? One for the Tories. We know that by 2020, 17, he's offering a referendum. You start on this, Alistair Campbell. Do you think he can? Well, it's up to the people to keep Britain in Europe because there's going to be a referendum. Uh, I hope to God that we do. Again, if I can go back to David Cameron's uh, constant sort of use of tactics and big, bold gestures and all the rest of it, we had, we're, we're having the referendum because of his fears about the rise of UKIP and his fears about the right wing of his party who are still there in bigger numbers today. The reality is that I think even having the debate is dangerous for Britain. I think that Britain no. is part of the European Union, it should stay part of the European Union, and I think that David Cameron... I think we will stay in Europe because ultimately I think the British people will, will vote yes. How come on... it's dangerous to debate it? Yes. Because yes. I think the next, to have the next two years with your party, Francis, you know this, you're going to be plunged into two years of internecine <clears throat> warfare about no. Europe. Yes, you are, about <laughs> Europe. And, and, yes, David Cameron will probably get some sort of deal to come back, put to the people, and hopefully we'll all vote yes. But I, 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 I think... So, yes, I think... Yes, he can, because I think the people will save him from himself. All right, the, the person there, you, the man there. Yes, quick point from you. Why is it dangerous to debate something yeah, that exactly. nearly Absolutely. four million people voted for yesterday? Yeah. They didn't just vote for that. They voted about immigration, they voted about jobs, they voted about health. Yeah. Yes, it is. But, the United okay. Kingdom so Independence Party. You no, just watch out for the next two let, years. Let, let him have his say. The United Kingdom Independence Party, That's which you are a supporter or not? No, I, I don't support them, but if four million people are saying voting for the United Kingdom Independence Party... <coughs> 
That's, not, that... why, that's not why we're having the referendum. We're having the referendum because David Cameron has called the referendum. Uh, Francis Maud. Oh, well, I think it's shocking that Alistair says it's dangerous to debate it. It's far more dangerous not to debate it. It's far more dangerous for there to be a, disconsent, a discontent with Britain's uh, relationship within the European Union and try to suppress it. It's much better. I think the I only, think my, my quarrel with, the, um, with Claire in her question is not can David Cameron keep Britain, it is do the people want to? And uh, I think what the public want, uh, but we'll ask them, is Britain to be in a European Union but one which looks and feels different, so that the relationship is different, right. so that it isn't on a kind of constant ratchet towards gre ever greater political union, which is where not. we get uh, swallowed up. Well, you say that, but actually built into the treaty, Alistair, uh, is the words ever closer union, and that means what it says. Right. And that is fundamentally, I think, what makes people uncomfortable with it, and what makes Britain an uncomfortable partner within the European Union. So I hope there will be a serious renegotiation which will solve, resolve this issue uh, for a generation and make us actually a much more comfortable partner within the right. European Union. And I think it can John be Swinney, are you, are you alarmed at the prospect of a, a, a referendum in Britain about a membership of Europe? Uh, I'm certainly alarmed about the possibility of the United Kingdom leaving the European Union. And I think what David Cameron well, can't... What, what I can't... What I'm concerned about is that David Cameron can't be guaranteed that the debate around the referendum will be on the terms of the referendum. It could be about other issues, and he could find himself, if his government is ever more unpopular in two years' time, um, facing a referendum, uh, you know, a, an outcome which is driven by other issues other than the contents of the, the referendum. But, but, but that's not the case with your referendum. Well, well, but... but I mean, well, you well, have no. a referendum. Yeah. Why can't the rest of Britain have yes, a referendum? But, but, you know, we, 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 took, we took the outcome it's of the referendum problem. and we accepted it. The, dif the difficulty, I think, so is a lot, of another one. a lot of damage could be done to uh, the, the economic interests of the UK right. um, if the referendum goes the wrong way. Right. I'm going to have to bring you to a close. We've only got a minute left, uh, Julia, and I'm, then I'll come to you, Paddy. Sorry, John. It, it never ceases to amaze me, the arrogance of the political classes, that the, the public are just far too stupid to be allowed to say. I've been a Eurosceptic very openly and proudly for many years. Now, I'll tell you why. A because I'm, for a because it I'm, sells your rag. Big, no, That's why. I, I don't work for any particular newspaper, okay. actually. The, the, get, the get newspapers I, lie Could I finish Europe? one point on, without yes. being interrupted? The point but is, you have to be that very for the, quick, for the last few decades, get the yes. political glasses have been handing over our powers without our permission, without any God's permission sake. whatsoever, Vote to undemocratic, unelected bureaucrats. Absolutely. And we have a right to say no. Pa 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 all right, pa Paddy Ashton, do you think Cameron will keep... I think I'm the first party leader ever to have recommended that we should have a referendum if, the, if Europe uh, took more powers from Britain a long time ago. So I'm not against referendums. I think the more sensible case is to have one when powers are moved there. But whether you believe that or not, we're now going to get one. In my view, we're going to get it earlier. They'll probably have it in 2016, 2016. Um, and, uh, and, uh, I, and then will Mr Cameron keep Britain in Europe? No, but you will. We'll have a debate in this country, and we'll have a debate that can be won for yes, and then this country will be liberated and, uh, toward, to play its full part in Europe, which it should be doing. Right. To have any other choice for our country would be absolutely okay. deadly. You have five, five seconds up there. Yeah. But you have five seconds. Make your point. It's just completely away. ridiculous for Alistair Camel to sit there telling this lady to get involved in politics and then say we shouldn't have a debate exactly. about... <laughs> On that note of debate, question time ends. Next week we're going to be in Uxbridge. The week after that we're going to be in Derby. If you want to come to either place, Uxbridge or Derby, you can apply at the website or you can call the number on the screen there, 0330-123-9988. Many thanks to our panel who came here tonight, all exhausted from uh, the <laughs> aftermath of the campaign, and to our audience here from London. Good night.